yeah good afternoon and uh, i am venkateshan so my field of interest is uh, helicopters like the previous speaker dr abhishek who gave he is also in the helicopter so we thought we will uh, have the lecture one after the other so that he will introduce the topic and i will carry it a little further basically because the this particular workshop is on dynamics and vibration you would have learned about basic things of spring mass system how to calculate vibration damping etc but where is it really applied something in the automobile is one area in the mechanical side then in the aerospace field <coughs> of course in the fixed wing aircraft you have their own problems but in the rotary wing dynamics and vibration plays a very major role in the sense because the vehicle itself is a vibrating vehicle so just to give you a historical uh, uh, perspective see this is uh, basically some popular statement in 1959 that vibration problem transcends national boundaries and uh, not only unique to us helicopter community and uh, of course this is a very interesting thing 1988 uh, statement made in one of the nasa proceedings basically it's a book that comes on vibration the vibration is something like it got to the point where instead of calling greeting when we meet how is it shaking it is still shaking because the vibration in helicopters is so high that that is the main characteristic of the vehicle itself so you can call it a it's a vibrating vehicle but some of the interesting things because of vibration what happens to design of helicopters these are some very few points which i have collected and then put it here see the initial test of this uhs utility helicopter 60 and uh, black hawk and another one is attack helicopter see these are first you design and then you may do some calculations etc and then when you do a flight test you suddenly find higher than expected rotor loads and anticipated rotor fuselage fuselage is that is the airframe that vibration interaction and then airframe resonance near the resonance you all have, must have learned now and it starts vibrating then excessive empennage is the tail portion vibration and vibration control devices they become ineffective and finally at the end of all the design you find that the lar- levels of vibration is much higher than what the user wants now what do you do you cancel the project you cancel the product or you start solving these problems because even today i would say that vibration problem plays a major role in helicopters and people live with that in the sense uh, you accept that vibration and then fly but keep on improving on that so i will briefly tell you till what has happened till date by and large how people are attacking this problem but they are still living with that see why it is vibrating see you have a helicopter see this is the rotor which keeps rotating It's like a fan and then you have a tail rotor conventional and then the the helicopter particularly when it flies it is actually pushing the air down when it pushes the air down and it flies forward also that time the flow goes over the fuselage and that is the rotor fuselage coupling you can have this mechanical coupling you can have the aerodynamic coupling then you have because the rotors are there you have transmissions then the engine all of them really vibrate because i had gone in some of the production that is initial helicopter development i had flown i have seen the kind of vibration that unless you see yourself uh, you know it is unbelievable you see it's not like you might have come in you are taken tempo in gt road it vibrates when you sit there it vibrates But that is nothing okay so helicopters are terrible 
Now, this is just to give you the level of some of the mil military specifications. The, with the x-axis is the frequency in hertz, and y is the acceleration level. If it is below 10 power minus 2 to minus 3, the acceleration due to the vibration, with frequency, you see, this is threshold of perception. If it is below that, you will not be able to feel that there is something which is vibrating. But the structure may experience, that is a different thing. But this is the human perception. But when you go a little higher, 10 to the power minus 1, this is actually less than that. You feel unpleasant. It's not very comfortable. But when you go to, this is about point, this is point 0.1, this is about point 0.2 g. They call it point 0.2, point 0.3 g. This is the military specification 8501. They want below 0.3 G vibration. But you see, this is unpleasant. This is much above the unpleasant. Otherwise, which is much higher, which is intolerable. You just cannot sit there. And then if the vibration becomes slightly higher, you can, pilot will fatigue. In the sense, after some uh, couple of hours of flying, he will feel tired. So they are very important in uh, handling the helicopter. So military specifications say, I want only this level over the entire, this frequency range, about, you can say, 22, 25, 30 hertz range. But if you look at vibration as a model, this is like we always call it a, how a dynamicist looks at the vehicle because the pilot is sitting in a cockpit. Of course, these are all, it's a flexible fuselage. And the blades are also flexible. So they are like beams. But beams, rotating beams. And these beams are controlled through various control rods. So they, everything is represented by a spring. So you say blades are coupled. Coupled mode in the sense why I say coupled is, these blades can vibrate this way they can vibrate this way. They can also twist and the axial force because rotation, you have a centrifugal load. So you have bending, out of plane bending. Out of plane is out of plane of rotation. In plane bending, then torsion, then axial. So all of them will be there in one blade. So you, everything happens simultaneously. So you have to analyze him as a coupled blade coupled mode analysis or something like that. Then they all get attached to the hub. But sir, there are certain interesting things because the vibration, the blades will vibrate purely because of the aerodynamic loads. Because where is the source for vibration? One is engine may rotate, but that frequency is higher frequency. The rotor, what is the source for vibration? It is basically the air. Because it goes round and round, it generates lift and it moves forward. That time varying lift is the source for vibration in helicopters. But you also need to fly the helicopter, so you have to keep it aloft. So there is a mean value of the aerodynamic load and there is a vibratory aerodynamic load. This vibratory aerodynamic load cause the vibration, mean one keeps the vehicle up. So you can say every load is, there is a mean quantity, there is a vibration quantity. Okay, so everything is due to the aerodynamics. And the vibration part excites all these modes and then that will come into the fuselage and the fuselage will start vibrating and the pilot will start feeling the vibration in his stick, in his seat, in his pedal, everywhere. Okay. Now, this is a very interesting curve in the sense, mil military specification. They put earlier 0.15 G as the limit, then they, that is A, old. Then they revised it. I want to bring it to 0.1 G. If you see 1950s, the vibratory levels were very high because the understanding is 
because you are improving, your technology is changing, your vibration devices are changing, you understand more about the modeling in your design. Then over the years it has come down. But still, this is only a trend. But if you see any production helicopter, if you see, it will go somewhere here initially. And after that slowly, prototypes and production prototype. Then you try to bring it down, bring it down, bring it down. And you bring it to some level, after that you just cannot do anything. So this is the, at least over the decades, the vibration has been the requirement as well as in the design, people have understood, okay, what should, if we do this, how we can minimize the level of vibration. So I will just briefly tell you about what are the procedures. And this is basically a, a new design standard. In the sense, the aeronautical design standards, that is 27. Suppose you have vibration in all directions. This is up and down, four and up, lateral, then how do I come up with one index? Because in the earlier diagram, it is one index, one G level. Now they define something called the intrusion index. Okay? What they do intrusion index is, you get the vibratory signal. That signal, you do a frequency analysis, that is a Fourier. You pick up the four frequencies which have the highest participation, highest value. Rest of them are small, so you leave them. And these four values you will have in the vertical direction, the lateral direction, the horizontal direction. Then what you do is they have given for vertical, lateral, longitudinal. Longitudinal is four and after. These are the kind of a limit. They have put frequency, this is some G level, this is the limit. You take each frequency, this is the outer limit, this value divided by this. You make it non-dimensional. Square it, you add for longitudinal, lateral, vertical. And all of them you do total. This is called the intrusion index. This is kind of a new measure of vibration. Okay. This was proposed, this is very recently, but still uh, this is not that popular except that to give a measure. But what is still used is the military specifications, 0.3G or below 0.1G, something like that. But still this is the more uh, relevant uh, number which is useful. Now for dynamic modeling, see, this is the rotor blade. I have to model the dynamics of the rotor system. Then how this rotor system is attached to the hub. Then this hub, this is the gearbox, everything is there. That will come and sit on the fuselage. And when it sits here, that is again this kind of spring, damper, some external force, some isolator device. And then this whole fuselage is a flexible so you understand, now if I want to analyze vibration for this kind of a system, I must be very clear about each component and how they are connected to the other component and the contribution, where is the source, how it is vibrating, what is the level of modeling I have to do, because solving this problem is not that easy. Okay. Now, so because it's a very complex problem, what do you do? you idealize. So what type of idealization people have been doing? If you, uh, this battery is going down, I think. Battery is going down, one minute. I'll use this. No, I'm taking this. See, what kind of idealization? One is I take the blade as a rigid blade. Rigid blade at some springs. So you see, now my model, which is an elastic blade, I am representing as only a rigid blade, but with some springs I put it at the root. But this model will simulate only few modes, fundamental mode of the beam. 
it will not simulate the higher frequencies of the plate. But they said, okay, at least let us have one. So fundamental is what is normally simulated in this. And then another one is fuselage here. This is for academic purpose they use because we don't have any other big fuselage model. So what you do is you take it as a beam. And then again solve for this. This is one simple model. Slightly complicated because that simple model cannot capture the fuselage frequencies and all the higher modes. So what you do is, okay, let me go on then improve my model. Improve my model is, you say, okay, I am going to take flexible blade now. That means I must have a mathematical model for representing a flexible blade. So that I have to learn. And this is, see, please remember, these are all developed over the last maybe six, seven decades. Slow improvements. So people will spend all their research career only in modeling the blade. So you learn that. And then now once you know, okay, how to model the blade, then you say, okay, let me model the fuselage. Because finite element methods have come, okay, I will create a fuselage of this type and then put something, then I will link all this. Okay. Why it is a complex problem, what we do is, if you look at it here, this is the fuselage dynamics means fuselage body. What are the excitation that comes on to the fuselage? One is the external effects, its own wind, whatever that comes and hits or any other body or you fire some missile, or any of this, they will have their own thing. In addition, the fuselage motion, that will go here. This is for the hub because when the fuselage moves, hub also moves, that vibrates. So the hub motion will come here. And then blade has its own aerodynamics. So that will also add here. Now you see the blade model is inertia, elastic forces, that is the, and the aerodynamic, we call it operator, but they are basically all those three forces. This is your simple spring mass damper system only. But the only thing is the complexity is more. But then the aerodynamic load depends on how the blade is vibrating. It is not that my load is independent of the motion of the blade or the vehicle. Therefore, this is an aeroelastic problem, call it, because the load depends on motion. Therefore, that is why I put this back, okay? So the, when the blade moves, my load also changes. So I have to look for the steady state solution. And then once I get that, I will get the blade root load. Then the root load, I sum up all the blade loads at the root. Then I get the hub. The hub load and the control rod, everything, they will again go to the fuselage. So this is how the entire loop of the formulation of a helicopter vibration problem has to be tackled. Now what you can do is you can analyze only this problem independently. But if you want to analyze the entire helicopter, you have to do everything. So you must have model for this, you should have model for this, okay. So I will briefly, so that is why in the analysis what people do is, when I do vibration, even now industry, they will assume that fuselage is rigid, okay. You assume it rigid. Then you calculate, because then the motion is only UVW, that rotation, that's all. There is no flexible mode. Nothing is included. You take that, you calculate the hub loads. That is here. You go, you put it here, you do. Once you have done that calculation, then you take that load. In a test, you build the fuselage. 
you apply the load at the rotor hub. So that means at that time when you are doing a test, please understand that load is not changing. In the sense, load does not depend on the motion of the fuselage. I know the load which I calculated earlier with some assumption. I take that load, I will put it on the structure, I will excite it. This is how the vibration problem is addressed in the industry. Because they build the fuselage, they apply the load, they study the vibration. After that, wherever they want to make a modification, they do it. Okay? Because you cannot do, after a in-flight, you can't do it. So this is before, when you are initially designing everything. So calculation is done with some assumptions. Take the, that is why it says, here I said, apply rigid fuselage, evaluate hub loads. Apply hub loads, evaluate fuselage response. In test or analysis, this is the way it is done. And you neglect the hub motion on blade loads, etc. This is neglected. But this is, you know a priori, this is the assumption I am making. So obviously, whatever vibration you evaluate, this, it is not going to be the one which will happen in flight. Because in flight, it's going to be different. So I will briefly give you the kind of equations. Because we have mentioned those four blocks. You have actually blade equations, fuselage rigid body motion equations, fuselage elastic modes because it's a three-dimensional structure, those equations. Then this is, I put it as an inflow. Inflow is because this is essential. The rotor rotates, it pushes the air down. That means what it pushes affects the load on the blade also. So I must have, this itself is a separate study. People have worked only on this alone. So inflow equations the rotor inflow and that changes depending on the load my inflow will change so if the inflow changes my load changes and then i take this full set of equations if you see this q which are basically i call them as the state variable you will have the trim so trim we call it equilibrium all the control angles this is inflow control angle attitude of the helicopter pitch roll then it will have response of the blade, flap, lead lag, torsion, axial I didn't include, but axial also is there. Then fuselage rigid body, fuselage elastic modes. So this is the full helicopter vibration problem. And I have to solve the entire set. Of course, you all know harm, some, how to solve that. One, one is formulation of the equation. Okay, with great difficulty I have formulated. But please remember, I have given it in just a symbol. You cannot write these equations because they will run to pages. Really, pages after pages after pages if you want to write. It. Now, symbolic manipulation has come. So, in computer you try to do it. Okay. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's a algebraically tremendous problem. It's a vibration problem. Then you say, okay, I'm going to assume harmonic solution. And this is what harmonic balance method. This is one technique. So every variable is expanded as a Fourier series. Then you take these things, you substitute in the whole equation, and then solve, collect all the harmonics of the cosine, harmonics of sine, and then solve the algebraic problem. Then you will get these coefficients, all of them. Then you say, I have got the vibration in the helicopter fully. But of course, I leave this part here. This is just to tell you, because the blade loads come to the hub. So it is like you have to sum up, because this summation I have put here, this is the blade load. One blade is here. One blade will give, at the root, you will have three forces, three moments, which are three shear forces, three moments. So each blade will have some load at the hub, at the root. 
and they will all be in different directions. So you have to transfer all those things along the fuselage, some fixed direction, then sum it up. And when you do the transformation, this is basically that cosine psi. This is nothing but the location of the blade in the, it is like a arm where, which azimuth location the blade is situated. Okay. So you have properly take all those things. When you do this kind of summation, some interesting thing happens. That interesting thing is, this is the blade load. This is the hub load. Okay. Blade will have many harmonics. Whereas when you do the summation here with this, some of the harmonics will drop out. And only few harmonics will get transferred to the hub. That is the key in this. So, uh, this is mathematically you can prove it. That's why uh, the important observation is the rotor hub acts like a filter. Filter means it doesn't stop the vibration. It filters out vibration only in certain frequencies, it will pass the, those particular frequencies to the fuselage. What frequencies they send it to the fuselage is P, N, omega. That's why P is any number, one, two, three. N omega is, N is the number of blades. Omega is the rotor RPM. So that is all. But N omega is called the blade passage frequency in the sense suppose you are sitting outside the helicopter it just rotates if you keep one particular location if you want to look at only one blade one blade will take some time whereas if there are two blades within one revolution you will see two blades passing if there are three one revolution you will see three blades passing so that means you will see a higher frequency so that is why n omega, n is the number of blades, omega is the rotor arc. So that is how the blade passage frequency comes. And this frequency multiplied by some 1, 2, 3, this is the harmonic. But if you look at the hub loads, you will have Pn plus minus 1 omega will come as Pn omega. This is like uh, in the blade higher frequency will come as a lower frequency in the fuselage. So this is the combination because of that transformation. That's why I have given one, this is a very simple example. I said four bladed rotor, that is there are four blades. If the frequency is 5.23 hertz, fuselage vibratory loads will have frequency four times this, eight times this, etc., etc. okay. This is mathematically you can prove and one important assumption is all the blades execute same motion. But this is again very difficult because industry when you manufacture a blade, you can't say everything is identical. You have a margin to clear the blades. You will say if the mass of the blade is maybe less than few hundred grams on either side, okay, blade is cleared. So they do mass of the blade, they do mass moment, not first moment, that is all, only these two parameters they check whether the blades are identical. But within a band, you clear it. It's not that every blade will have the same value. That means no two blades are precisely identical, okay? So when they are not identical, you will start having all the frequencies. Here, if they are identical, you filter out some frequencies. If they are not identical, you will start having other frequencies coming into the... That's why helicopters always vibrate. And, of course, this is a requirement for analysis. I said, you have a rotor blade model, fuselage model, rotor fuselage interface. And rotor blade model consists of structure, inertia, aerodynamics. Fuselage, you need to have a 3D full structural model, then the interface, geometric and aerodynamic, all of them. I'll just very briefly 
If you look at a rotor system alone, how the rotor blade is designed. I have given here three types of rotor system. They are not all the same. In the early days, they call something called articulated rotor. Articulated rotor means the blade is attached to the hub through hinges. Like I can move freely. It's a hinge. And I can do this way. This is like a hinge. Okay. And those articulated hubs, because why they put a hinge, you may ask, because I relieve moment. So that I don't transfer the moment to the helicopter. Otherwise, initially when they were flying the helicopter, when they were going, helicopter will roll, because one side load is more, other side load is less, aerodynamic load. Because one side the blade is going like this, other side blade is going backwards. So there is a relative air difference. Because of that, one side lift will be more, other side will be less, so helicopter will topple. So to avoid that moment, they put a hinge. Now that hinge was, if you put a hinge, wear and tear, mechanical maintenance, all those problems will come and it becomes more complicated because a lot of moving parts. That is this. Then they designed with the composite technology. When it came, they said, okay, we will remove the hinge, but we create an equivalent hinge. Equivalent means I design my blade such that this is flexible. So it is like a flexible, at some section I create a flexibility so that it bends nicely. Okay, so it is a, you create a virtual hinge. But how is it possible with the composite material? Because they have, uh, you can tailor the properties, etc. So these blades started coming only after 80s. And the design became more cleaner. Because if you look at the number of parts, this will have more than 500 parts. This became less number of parts. Further improvement, of course, there are some bearings for changing the angle. That also can be removed. That is called the bearing list. But today, in the world, you know, of course, India also, we have this type of rotary for the air main and this type of bearingless rotor for the tail. But the bearingless main rotor still is not, except one helicopter, nobody flies that. Otherwise, you will find all the old helicopters, they are all this. And now, if you see the number of parts, there is a drastic reduction in this, but the technology analysis, everything is, is really challenging from one to the other to the other. Now, this is as far as the rotor blade is concerned. And uh, of course, I leave this part. Uh, this is all some data which I have calculated. Then you go to fuselage. Okay, so blade, I say I know how to model it. I got these frequencies, more shapes, etc. Then I go model the fuselage. You create, nowadays, uh, all finite element programs are available the market, you can buy them, model the entire fuselage. Modeling is not that difficult. But then comes, uh, we, have, we have made our own model because they have basically like a wireframe kind of model because we wanted, when we wanted to do research, we wanted to have some realistic model, okay? And then we calculated the frequencies of this type of structure. If you look at the natural frequency, because by now you all will know natural frequency. Natural frequency of this, you will see so many natural frequencies, they are all very close to each other, 3, 4, 9, 12, see around 22, 23, 24. The frequencies are all not well separated. They are all very close to each other, natural frequency. So, any change in one you do, the other will become, pick up the vibration. So it's very, very difficult to for this type of a shell type structure, okay? And uh, apart from natural frequency, there is still a challenge. What is the level of damping which is there in the fuselage structure? So what they do, they do shake test. So when they do the shake test, this is the test data. I am just presenting some data which I 
got from literature because we don't get uh, anything uh, immediately from industry because these are all, see, you know, this is the test data. So you have some damping. Theoretically, I have to put a damping in my structure. If I want to do, I have to add some damping. But it, it is not uniform everywhere. If you see different frequencies, the level of damping, it varies. This is an experimental measurement. Now, how I take this into account? How do I get a better representation of the actual fuselage in my analysis so that my vibration prediction is at least reasonable? Okay, this is still a cha challenging problem. And if you see here, this is just a frequency response calculation. I'll show only the, of a fuselage magnitude, and this is the phase. See, the, this, this continuous line is the test. This dash is the theoretical model prediction. You will see here, in the lateral direction, they are all very far away in the mathematical modeling. You shake it, you measure the, this is the frequency, this is the vibratory level. Okay? Test data to your analysis model. So what you do is you do a test, then you keep on refining your model. You keep changing the values, parameters. Till reasonably you get, okay, now you say, this is my fuselage model for my analysis. Now, I will go and then solve for the response of the helicopter. From the mathematical point of view, I will have, these are all nonlinear coupled differential equations with periodic coefficients. Why I said periodic is, this is something which is peculiar for helicopters. You all know mx double dot plus cx dot plus kx equal to f of t. m, c, k. They are constants. Till now you have learned. But for us, that C, K, they are not constants. They vary with time. In the sense, they vary periodically. That is because of some aerodynamic effects. Okay? So, this is called a periodic system. So, there is a difference. That's why, even though that's a vibrating system, that's what I'm saying. Complexities goes up with the different, different uh, vehicles or models or something like that. And now I will go, this is an interesting thing I thought I will show you. With this I can, so you have overall I kind of explained to you the complexity involved in the helicopter vibration analysis. So in 1898, uh, that is the JHS is the actually General American Helicopter Society. So they, one helicopter they took at the data, that is the links. This is like a non-dimensional angle. Uh, CT by sigma is one non-dimensional parameter. And forward speed they measured 293, that is some non-dimensional speed. Two speeds, 180 in kmph, 293 kmph. And they measured three per row min, this is a non-dimensional frequency. Basically, you can take it three times the rotor RPM, five times the rotor RPM. They measured the flap moment. Moment means bending moment at the root of the blade in the flap direction, and then torsion moment and lead lag shear load at the root. Then four, four times the frequency, flap shear load, and then control draw loads. And they took vertical, 4G vertical vibration and the pilot and the co-pilot in the cockpit. These data were measured for a helicopter with the, some data, not full data. Is there. Then they said, okay, every company, every person manufactures. Now let us see how good we are able to predict the vibratory levels in the helicopter. So 26, see, this is like uh, 26 groups, means uh, research groups. Eight said uh, we will do the calculation because sometimes research groups also are a little, see, now you are going to compare different research groups. Whose model is better than, but one data is sample. This is good. This way you advance your 
knowledge. And the eight said we will participate as observers. Now in the next, uh, it's very difficult for you to see, uh, but I thought I can't squeeze it uh, or enlarge it. These are essentially the eight organizations. The various data, this is given as what type of models they have in their own program. These are basically different companies. Companies and one is the University of Maryland. Yeah, here it is, University of Maryland. What model they have? They said, this is how I model my plate. This is my fuselage uh, model. This is how I model my aerodynamics. This is, this is called current technology model. Because today, I have this technology. I have created these models. Majority of them are from industry. So the same data of the helicopter given to every group, you analyze. But they don't supply the flight data. They will give only the blade parameter. What data you want, we will give you. But we will not give you the result. Then you calculate those results. We will make a comparison. Okay. Now I will say the first thing is just the blade frequency because this is the first thing which everybody has to calculate modeling the blade, rotor blade. Okay. So this is clear. There are eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. These are first lag means fundamental mode in the lead lag motion. Fundamental first fundamental in uh, flap motion. Then second natural frequency, second lag, like that. This is the test data. And this is the code average of all this. If you see, test data is 0.71. It's non-dimensional because frequency divided by rotor RPM is what they do, natural frequency. Now, if you look at these codes, one predicted 0.71. But one is 0.65. The range is between 0 0.65 and 0.71. Then you go to the second flap model. The test was 2.76. You have 2.81, 2.69 from that range. That means right at the beginning of your modeling. This is the frequency. Then there is, of course, the mode shape is there. Mode shape, you can't measure it in flight. Uh, so they just, uh, whatever you get, you take it. These numbers are themselves, there are differences. It may be due to the mathematical model or mathematical approach. Well, but if you by and large, you will say, ah, they are reasonably all right. But if you go to higher frequencies, third lag, 10.54, 9.94. So you start looking at difference, lower, higher. Different codes predict different frequencies, but they are by and large around that number of experiment. But please remember, if you take the third flap and the second flap, these frequencies, 2.81 is very is close to 3. 2.76 is not as close, even though it is 0 0.5 difference is there, but it's not. You will be able to get a higher vibration because of these numbers because you are going close to some frequency and that will start picking up. Now, then this is the first. Then they did, okay, vibration measurement. So I am not showing the intermediate other results. This is the test data. Vibratory level measured at cockpit port side. That is a, another one, starboard side. Left side, right side, you can take it. Pilot, co-pilot. And this is the cosine harmonic, this is the sine harmonic of the only one signal, that is the fourth harmonic. Different uh, at the speed, 64 knot, that is 118 kilometer per hour. This is the measured data. Now, all these people, you, with your code, you predict the vibration. Suppose if I tell you, you give me what is the G level. Then you may come closer. But here what they did was, they did not said, give me the magnitude. They said, give me, 
your vibration both in the sine harmonic and the cosine harmonic and then they put that value. Then they compared. You see, various tests, something came close, some are far away and then how they evaluated the error. This is at 64, if you go to high speed because the vibration will be more, you see test data is here whereas all the other vibration prediction is all over the place, okay? So, now you may say magnitude wise I am predicting it correctly, but the face is wrong. So, what they did was, okay, how do I measure the error in the predicting? This is the kind of diagram. It's a very interesting way. You say, this is my test point. This is my prediction or if you say this is the test, this is the prediction. You join this like a vector and take this distance. That is your error of prediction. Suppose if the magnitude is same, see both sides, this length may be same, but you have predicted really opposite face. So again the error will be more. So what they did was they did the error calculation in all the vibratory loads of the helicopter and plotted whatever that measured data which was there, 3 per rev lag, 5 per rev, 5 per rev means 5 times the rotor RPM, 3 times the rotor RPM, 4 times like that. These boxes are all the errors. This dashed line, what is shown in the end thing is actual measured. So the error is of the order of the measurement. And sometimes the error is much higher than the measured value itself in some of the cases. This is at 64 knots and here this is at 158 sorry, knots. So you see the error itself, that means the amount of error I am having is almost like what my signal is. So it's like signal to noise ratio is one type of a thing, you were saying. I am unable to predict the real vibration. So then what happened is they said, okay, if this is the problem, you improve your model. So where do you go and improve? So all of them, this is the current technology model. That is why I put CTM, they call it. CTM is current technology model. Improved technology. What is the improvement you make to your modeling and see again whether you can predict it. So the improved technology, every majority of the code group, they went and improved their aerodynamic model because that is where still there are, uh, even today there are issues. Let us improve, I told you, the rotor rotates and pushes the air down, that is the inflow. That inflow calculation, there is a very simple model to uh, complicated models are there. Complicated in the sense in terms of time it takes to compute is more. And uh, you only believe that, well, I will get a more, a better approximate result. It's not an accurate result, better approximation. Okay, simple model will be quick, you can calculate it. But as you complicate your CFD, this is like not CFD, there is some vortex method or something because you, I do not know how much of you know that technique. If you use that, then the computational time becomes very high. But they said, okay, you do that calculation with the increased computation, then whether improvement is there. Okay. I will go directly to this diagram. This is the current technology model, this is the improved technology model. So you find there are some improvements in some codes, but it is not same in other codes. Because whatever improvement they have done, sometimes it is better, some place it is actually made it worse. Okay. So what are the important observations of that study was? Current technology models exhibit 60% error. Advanced models, this is what, like 
fuselage, upwash means the fuselage which is giving a interference to the rotor. And then unsteady aerodynamics produce minor improvements. But this is one free wake. Free wake is the computational time, which I said the inflow, which you have to calculate. Rotor, which is rotating, it pushes that, that variation, velocity. If you do a more sophisticated calculation, it provides significant improvement. So the improved technology model prediction after doing this is no better than 50% of test data. Particularly major deficiency happens at high speed. So the reason they said is okay, very poor prediction of the flap outer plane bending movement at the blade root and the flap load. They took a blade because this is a very, very expensive test if you want to perform. And uh, they put 221 pressure transducer on the blade. Okay. They put several accelerometers and strain gauge. In flight, they measured the loads for various air speed loads were measured. Hmm? And then these were given for some comparison, flight test observations. This is a high G pull-up means the helicopter is flying, it just tries to go up, high G pull-up. Now pitch link is a link which is connected to the blade the root, every blade will have because that is used to change the angle of the blade. That is called pitch link. Now they measured, it is, even today it is a very challenging problem to measure that load. So that is the control rod loads increase by a factor of three due to dynamic stall. Dynamic stall means the blade, rotor blade, these are rotor aerodynamic loads. Okay. So here, these are two maneuvers. How the load picks up? It is only five seconds. They do that, they will not do continuously. They measured this. <coughs> if you see here, pitch link load, these are all measured loads. Maximum level flight load is about 1000, they are given pounds. But in maneuver, it can go up to 3000. Even though it may be for a short time, but the load will go three times very high. But prediction of pitch link load is still uh, very challenging. And now, uh, some of our colleagues, uh, that is the earlier speaker, he also did work on this maneuver load only. That was his PhD topic. Okay. Now, this is another result which I thought I will give you. Between theory, experiment of various codes, where we stand. This is the flight test, that continuous line. And these things are Basically, this is the flight test, this is one program, this is another program, you see, none of them are matching. Here, this is the flight test data, okay? And you see, this is the predicted loads. So, the level of knowledge, of course, helicopters are flying, that is uh, not a problem. Here, this is another status, okay? So, I will come to now a very brief thing on Okay, you are not able to predict the vibration. We are improving. So we also have developed some models which we are giving it to HAL and uh, we are trying to predict all the loads because now India has, we have our own helicopter. Design, develop, it's flying. So we can have flight test data. So slowly we will improve our model. But that is in terms of the predictive capability of your model Another one is, okay, can we reduce the vibration? This happens only after you have made your helicopter, you start flying, you suddenly say, I have more vibration. Now you can't say, I go back and then start changing the entire design. Okay, whatever remedial measures. Okay. So we look at the remedial measure what are the remedial measures which people really look at it? 
if you see, there are two approaches you can say. One is the passive approach. Passive approach means you, you go back, okay, change some structural modification. I modify my structure doing something. And then, uh, well, this is also optimization, mathematical study you have to do. Then you put some absorbers, pendulum absorbers. Or you introduce some vibration isolation devices. This is what is followed pretty much majority of the companies. In the active thing, see the research has been going on for several years. Even now it is going on. But I don't think anybody has reached to a level where it is completely active control because there are practical challenges. So they say higher harmonic control, individual blade control, these are technologies. Active flap, that means you put a flap on the blade itself and then start oscillating and try to reduce. And that research has been going on from in academics to industry, maybe in the last 20 years. And still people are working on that because the aerodynamic load prediction is still the challenge. And then another one is active control of structural response. That means you put some active struts, measure the vibration, keep oscillating them. It's like a, some, somehow you cancel your vibration. But today, a lot of people follow this isolation devices. Aries means anti-resonant isolation, dynamic anti-vibration isolation, live is liquid inertia vibration eliminator. These are all uh, names given for various, everything tries to reduce the vibration. They use these type of things. But when I go and then some of the helicopters use this. But then when I put the blade or hub mounted pendulum absorber, the drag when I want to fly at high speed, it may reduce vibration. But then what will happen is it will increase my drag. Then I cannot go high speed. So everything and whenever I add, everything is adding weight. Now you see, you design your helicopter at one stage. Now I say, oh, my vibration is here. put something here, something here, something there. I mean, then my payload capacity slowly starts coming down. Okay? So I think I'll leave here because otherwise this will go into a different. You have any questions, you can ask me. Because, huh? Little, you want blade design. Okay, this is the blade design. Since you asked me, just only blade, how do I go and place my frequencies? Okay? There are two things. One is blade design means you are talking about structural design. You are treating like a beam. Uh, how do I? What is your specific question? Then I can answer yours. Blade? Blade cross section. Cross section. Yes. That is an aerofoil shape. Yes. 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 And then what is the Yeah. Okay. I will. I can draw. If you can see here, I can draw that. I have a blade cross section with me in my office. Actual blade cross section, cut cross section. I have seen in pictures from this side, no? Picture. I have. <laughs> you can have a. You can lift it and then you can yes. see it now. You can, if you come to me, I will show you. See. I have blades. See, this is like this. Yes. If it is a metallic blade, what they do is they put okay. And now I am not going to show anything here because this may be like this. They okay. I'll 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 leave it like this. Why I am saying is the trailing edge portion, this portion, okay, that is a very thin plate with a honeycomb structure. This is solid. In the sense, solid means this is hollow. This is a thick wall structure. It goes through and through. This is a metal blade. Composite blade design will be somewhat similar, but then they may fill it up with foam here. Because why they fill up with foam is because 
if I press it, I don't want that to deform anything. It, it wants the shape to be maintained. Okay. So this is what, why is that, see there are key aspects in the design is, the center of mass of the blade, they want to keep it at 25 percent of this. Okay. This you say, see, if I say this is the 25 percent of C. Center of mass, they would like to keep it. And 25 percent, if you, if you are aerodynamics, you know that is the aerodynamic center also. Okay. And then uh, shear center is one more center. That is from structures. You, that also, they will try to keep it at 25 percent. Why is it so that you don't introduce coupling between bending and torsion? But 25 percent is theoretically you want to keep as close as possible. Sometimes it will be nearby, but it's okay. Now, is it? Uh, now, I answered some of your doubts. Most or? of the things. Huh? Most of the things. Okay, what you uh, left? You asked. Uh, one me. question, sir. Actually, in literature, I have seen certain papers. The, most of the uh, authors they have used Euler Bernoulli beam model. Okay. Uh, is, is there any not? reason? Means only the. Is, is there any reason why Euler Bernoulli? Uh, means uh, when advanced theories are there. You see, what happened was initially when the blade modeling started, it was in 1950s. Okay. First helicopter flew 1942. 3942 was the first helicopter flight. Sikorsky, because he is credited for. It's like uh, other people also flew, but uh, he made one mechanically simple, controllable, and uh, flying vehicle. Others had problem, but this was that was that's why at that stage the development of a helicopter stopped because everybody understood now you can make it. Then what developments happened is it is a technology development. Earlier <laughs> development was actually trying to lift the vehicle and then keep it allowed and controllable. Once that is achieved, then the technology improvement. So that time, 1958, are the first blade model, Hubert and Brooks. But that was a very linear there were error. Then 70 people started really modeling the blade. Coupled, I told you, flap, lag, torsion modeling. That time, it is isotropic. Then they brought in the composite thing. At that time, they introduced the shear deformation. But shear due to torsion is always included, please understand. Because otherwise without uh, shear, uh, torsion you cannot model it. But the bending shear, like a Timoshenko beam theory, that is later they introduced. But you find that it is, see for dynamics analysis, it's not that critical. It's not that much critical. That is why even if you make the error, you will be able to predict the frequencies very well. And I have a model which is fully developed and that is what we have used, uh, which has a curved beam, swept tip, all those complexities. We have a FEM model which is, that is given to a chain. In the sense, uh, this is our own, you can say, indigenous code which we developed. But the strain, stress strain, we follow a very systematic approach to obtain a strain at any point on the cross-section of the blade. That approach is there, very clear. If you want to improve it, yes, you can do 3D level, but with this is good enough today for most of the, it predicts very good frequency, even experimentally. But if you want to go for stresses and strains at a particular stress, then yes, I agree, this model may not be very good. Okay, any, any other question, anything? You can ask anything you feel like. G level. Okay, G level is, you, you, you know, if you say there are two types of G levels, I would like to mention. One is the maneuver load. That is, they call it load factor. Okay. Another one is the vibration. This is also G, that is also G. In vibration, you call it as you know any signal x is equal to some capital X, 
sin omega t if you say hmm what is the velocity x dot is capital x omega sin becomes cosine right and then acceleration will be x double dot which will be minus omega square capital x sin omega t okay what is the magnitude of the acceleration peak amplitude of the acceleration is omega square x right this is my maximum acceleration understood this divided by non dimensionalized acceleration due to gravity which is g that is 9.81 i'll put it g acceleration due to gravity this factor is the g level which is vibratory level 0.2 g 0.3 g 0.2 0.3 i showed on the diagram right this vibration is this is 0.2 so from here you can calculate if you want what is the amplitude of vibration if i give my frequency what is my vibration this is g level in vibration please understand you also have another non dimensional with respect to g which is they call it load factor maneuver i am doing a, suppose i am flying steady my load is <coughs> equal to weight whatever the lift lift equal to weight is 1g but if i do maneuver then my lift has to be higher okay then lift that value divided by w that is the load factor extra load factor that is more than g more than one yeah that is more than one and you can have zero also you can have zero load factor that is if you are going inverted flight on the top you can get a zero g zero g maneuver is that is all g there also they use the g 1.1 g maneuver 2 g maneuver 0 g maneuver also they do 0 g means the load is zero but helicopter they don't allow that 0 g aircraft does 0 g otherwise they call it 9 g also that is also g this is also g okay is it now you are clear good because this is very essential <laughs> okay good any other questions you have